how are you? It's, thank you so much for joining me on Geisha Chat. It's a bit of an honour to have you here. Oh, shut up. You sound like you don't know me. It's uh, nice to see you. That sounded really insincere, but it's genuinely nice to see you. So, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Well, um, it's an honour because I do know you, so haha, that's why it's <laughs> an honour. <laughs> see what I did there. Um, listen, how so lovely to see your face first of all I get we just I before do. we started recording I said that to you I'm like I get a wee bit of mosh when I love people a lot I, I see their faces and I'm like Ooh. oh yeah nice to see you are you how are you doing I mean this is this is brutal eh uh, yeah it's kind of brutal I mean oh, I don't know I suppose we're just you know I mean it we're just dead lucky we've not been personally affected by you know deaths or losing people our kids are okay yes. I've got buddies who have lost relatives and it's tragic but as a family we're we're all right so we're just we're bashing on and um mm -hmm. slightly mystified by I live in Brighton so mystified by the way it's been handled by certainly the English uh, government side of stuff um but I yeah. mean this isn't this isn't the forum for it but we're all right we're all right we're doing I know it. It's interesting though, actually, because you do live, like we're sitting in Glasgow going, oh, that's terrible, people going to the beach. But I'm not condoning it in any way, but I suppose mm. there is an element of you live in a lovely seaside town and I guess that's kind of the norm and you go, people are being really irresponsible, of course, but it must be a bizarre feeling because it kind of almost sets the energy of where you live. When I was down there, I thought, oh, God, yeah. such a lovely feel about the place. And it is because people just gravitate towards the coast and way to go walking and things so it must be tough. Well, yeah, you, you kind of don't blame people to an extent because the government you know have said that you can travel right i totally get that and then where would you want to go on a nice day you'd want to go to the seaside and it's just when yeah. you see groups of guys drinking and chucking their cans about and the place is just yeah. minging afterwards you're going it kind of makes your heart sink a bit that you've, you've you've you're putting lives in danger but you're also just kind of no respect for the place you're visiting and that's a bit sad but however um, yeah, totally. However, that and is by the by. You are part of this. Uh, the reason I do this is because I want to interview people that I love and people that I have lots of people who inspire me and I think are brilliant. And one of the things that I love about you, because I've known mm -hmm. you for so long, is now that you are a dad. You've got two children. Yeah, and, um, got two kids, man. Yeah, that's that's. How is that? Cause they're quite young, aren't they, Greg? So that's mm. that must be tough. Um, in terms of just having them, just them being about, but <laughs> just, I mean, just generally try to reason with them. Existence. I mean, <laughs> these guys have got really very limited sense of reasoning. Uh, it's it's just met, it's mental all the t it was mental before pandemic, and then during pandemic, you know, they've they've settled down a bit. So at the beginning, they were you know all over the place. Of course they were, of course they were. Um, yes. But I've got we're, we're a good wee team. You know, my wife. You know, my wife, and she's amazing. And the kids, the kids are really they're really good. But generally speaking, being a being a dad in this industry is difficult. And then when the industry seems to get kind of effectively wiped out overnight, it's. Um, you know, it's a whole new set of um, thoughts and issues that you need to deal with. So that is, it is difficult. It is difficult. Yeah, it's not easy. And also, um, before we talk about the fun stuff, I, I know mm. that you're really open and, about this, and I love that you are because I think it's really important. I was actually chatting to a pal of ours, lovely Sanjeev Kohli, the other day. Oh, yeah. And we, we chatted about this because he's chatted about it also. And mm -hmm. we were saying how important it is actually that people – of a position you know with a platform when they do and people who are known for being very very funny and mm -hmm. you know loads of fun there's things that happen in your life where you know you're not having a good time and, you, and mm. kind of you shy away from it and we kind of it's really stigmatized and I just wanted to chat a wee bit to you about that because especially just now you know is everything okay do you feel good and if you don't feel good how are you kind of what are you doing for mental health to kind of combat that, you know? Yeah, I think, generally speaking at the moment, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, yeah, I think a few weeks ago, it was, there was some pretty big ups and downs. And, and that's, of yeah. course, related to, you know, what what's going on. I think a lot of this pandemic and a, a lot of people, I mean, generally across the board, not just people who've kind of suffered with mental health stuff, but this, this lack of feeling of control and... Um, you know, just the fear that is in society about this pandemic and, and, you know, the number of people who have died and what you can do. So what I've tried to do, and actually what I've done quite well, I'm quite proud of myself, is 
only really trying to get through the day and controlling the day and trying not to look at too much. Yeah. Because it's not out of disrespect for the people that are suffering. It's out of a kind of trying to just maintain enough positivity in your own life to get through. And I think, oh my goodness, what was that? Is it still quiet? That's not a good sign if it's still quiet. I might go and check that. Go and investigate. Can I, can of I course. Go and just because that was quite a big one. Of course. Quite a loud oh. one. One sec, one sec. So, I'll give you a summary can of I that. Can I just say, little girl, and I just, your wee girl is like a mini you, and I could just hey. hear, Dad! And it makes did me you, Did you hear what she like, said? No, I just heard her going, Dad! <laughs> so, there was a big thud there. I kind of, it was so big a thud that I had to go and investigate it. I shouted down, I said, is everyone okay? My wife said, yep, like that. <laughs> and then first bit, she said, dad. And then the second bit of it was, can you fix it with your super glue? So I don't know what's happened, but something's broken. Anyway, it's all good. They're all right. It's really funny because I was like, I hope his windows are still intact, man, because... <laughs> well, whenever my daughter says, can you mend it with your super glue? It tends to be something that you most definitely cannot mend with super glue. Yeah, yeah. So, but no, we're, we're good. We're good. And I'm all right. And, you know, I found as, and as well, I've just found speaking to people, it's always a way and it's always the message. And it's, it's something I try and do whenever I can is like when you're feeling rubbish. And I've got a few buddies as well that I've spoken to, and as I'm sure you have over this past while that have really been struggling a bit. And, um, and I, yeah. I, I phone them and they phone me and we try and have uh, open discussions. So all I would say to people, and it's not just about now, or it's about any time going forward, is, is really the more you say what's on your mind, generally speaking, I think the, the better it is. And you, you offload and then you, you recalibrate and hopefully yeah. people have got either buddies to speak to or there's various mental health organisations that are there really to listen. They're not there to even make sure. judgment just to listen and so I would always say to keep yeah. talking I think that's key as well what you said is taking everything a day at a time because it's there's uh, your head can I mean as we know beautiful Julie who you write so well <laughs> her head nearly explodes because there's too much yeah. going on in there and that's what happens in sincerity it's like you can't do that like nobody wants to <laughs> you can't let your brain your little brain would pop open you know no the, the good thing about <laughs> Julie I would say though is that <laughs> Uh, is that that as much as as much as there's a lot going on, right? She doesn't dwell on much because <laughs> there's so I many new it. thoughts. There's so many new <laughs> thoughts day to day that it's a whatever happened. <laughs> well, whatever happened, say I don't know, five minutes ago, she's moved on from. So yeah. uh, it's a bit like you know, she's a bit like a wee magpie, isn't she? My friend Russell, yeah. you must have seen that in my character as well from years ago. My friend Russell often says to me, Leah. Because he helps me be tidy, right? He's like he's, he assists me in loads of production things, but he also assists me in my life. And he goes, "Leah, he tidy around blah blah blah." And he goes, "Oh no, but you tidy around." We go, "Oh, shiny!" And it's like this little magpie, <laughs> like just the brain. And Julie, yeah, that's, yeah. that's where that's where Julie it's comes real. from. But <clears throat> that's what I we'll chat to you about about your work, of course. Yeah, um, of course. Uh, of course, darling. And um, yeah, funny you should put that voice on because I was going to ask you about um, your training because. I wondered, I know that you trained at the Academy, which is now known as the Conservatoire, and I wondered, I, I'm pretty sure that you actually did something a bit more academic at uni before then, did you? Is that right? Or have I made that well, up? borderline academic. <laughs> um, I did, do you know what? I, started, I, I did started say you attempted. <laughs> well, attempted too. <laughs> well it, it's an, I did attempt, actually, but it, it wouldn't sound academic. But basically what happened was in my final year at school, I did drama, much to the surprise of, everyone right because all i'd been interested really? in was, yeah football tennis and golf was all i was interested so, in as a teenager. so no kind yeah right really so no interest in drama as a teenager really well no no one in my family i loved films um i wasn't too bothered about the theater going to as such when i was a young teenager that changed massively but um kind of a crucial thing did happen actually in my standard grades was uh I always forget to mention this because it was one of the things that really was a catalyst was um, a supply teacher came in. I always remember a Mr. Scott, he was called, but he was there for like a few weeks, kind of supply, but covering. Yeah. And um, we did a creative writing thing, he set us something, and I wrote this story. And he, 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 I always remember him calling me over once he, you know, this teacher's at the desk, he said, 
look, he said, see, grammatically, this is terrible, but there's, there's something in this. He said, you've, you've written this amazing story, but the grammar, you've written it, and, it, and it, I still write like this to the day, because it's scripts and character, and you see how I write is with the, the dashes and the dots, and the dashes and the da you know, it's not grammatically, it's the rhythm it's of how sound. you it. Uh -huh, sound, kind of that. Yeah. So anyway, he said to me, look, I think you've, you've got a skill at the, at the dialogue and the writing, you should, you should keep doing this, but you have to learn how grammar works mm. as well. But of course, yeah. I just didn't really listen to that. But, but, um, <laughs> but in terms of that giving me some confidence, that gave me my first little bit of confidence. And then eventually, by, that was in, what, fourth year. But in fifth year, I was like, no, I'm not doing it as a main hire at that point. I don't know where they are now. Uh, and then in sixth year, uh, I did drama. My PE teacher, Mr. Smith, was like, what's this about you doing drama? Is this a joke? I said, no, no, I just, I, I don't know. I would want to do it as a final year thing and then because of all my sporting background when I did drama sixth year I did a short film with an Oscar winner no, no doubt uh, no less yes. uh, a guy called Jack Cardiff yeah he filmed the African Queen and um, uh, what else did he, he did um, he won an Oscar for uh, Black Narcissus which is this incredible film anyway on that short film it's amazing drama, yeah it's incredible his stories he used to go out with Sophia Loren I mean it's just like he was the most amazing guy. But on that set, as a young actor, I was like, oh, I want to be an actor. I want to be an actor. I want to be an actor. I'm going to be an actor now. They said, <laughs> whatever advice I'd give you, don't go to drama school at 17. So, uh -huh. I, which in Scotland, of course, you can do it. And then when I went home and said to mom and dad, oh, they, they think I should go and do something else. My mom and dad were like, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Go and, go and study sport, like you're, what you're really good at. And then if you still want to be an actor, you know, we'll, we can talk about that later in the line. And so I took the professional's advice, studied, uh, got into Stirling Uni to study sport, got to Stirling, found out that sport studies was not like doing PE at school, playing five-a-sides all day. And <laughs> yeah. It was like the study of science like and sport. Biology and all that. Biology yeah, and, yeah. And, and, you know, properly how to train your body and, and uh, yeah. all that, because Stirling's like an elite sports place. Um, but I dropped out of it. It was too difficult, because by that point, I'd got the acting bug, so I just spent all my time acting. But at Stirling, I studied... Once I'd stopped the sport stuff, because it was too difficult... Um, I did a business degree, and so I learned how that, to write. That's what I was thinking of, yeah. Yeah, something. so I, I learned. Was, I, did, I knew there was something mm -hmm. quite, yeah. So it's kind of, a, sorry, it's a bit of a long-drawn way of saying but it. Do you know but, what, though? Yes, yeah, a business degree is it's going to be really helpful for an actor. Well, it's Best hugely time. helpful. But yeah. it not only did it help me think about acting as a business, but it helped me think about when you're writing a pitch document or when you're writing... Uh, even if you're st structuring a sitcom, actually, is that what you're trying to do is do the most with the least amount of words. It's like the basics of poetry or writing a script. Yeah. In a business report, you need to summarise whatever has happened in that business or whatever yeah. situation you're reporting on in the fewest number of words with the biggest impact. So in yeah. a weird way, I would never have thought at the time doing that would, would help me later on. Than, you know, and, and it's helped me hugely. Yeah. And it, it helps you because you are very, you're so astute and quite often I'll, it makes me laugh. Like even when we chat and text messages, you can see us, I'm like, oh my God, Greg's like, you can say the funniest, you get your point across, the funniest little reply and it's like that. And I'm like, ah! to say, and you'd probably go in and go, just take that out, just take that out, take that out. <laughs> this is what you're trying to say, Leah, you know? And that's probably a talent that's come, you know, it's loads of hard work, but you've, you've obviously got that, that, um, you get that ability and that knowledge from from that place. I mean, I suppose it's a little bit like me going and doing marketing for nightclubs. It's probably no different, Greg. Really, when I yeah, need but, all my but, business knowledge. <laughs> aye, but you doing that, like you know. But there's a, there's another strand for you though. Is like you going out doing nightclubs, meeting people, seeing people, absorbing people, communicating with people. You know yeah. that is hugely valid. And how you can act in those situations, like you know, being out and about, that is that's still a Do skill. A good net. I do a good net, don't I? You do do a good net. That says a I'll lot. I do a good net. But you're great at doing the nets. <laughs> you do, you're, it's funny when you do. You did, you, we do characters in the wings. These are the nice few moments I like to talk about that people just would never know you do. And when we were doing pantomime, we used to do some character voices in the wings. And one of my favourite ones was the, 
was a voice that you, a character that you'd made up and it just used to make me laugh. And you used to stroll on, your physicality all changed, you stole the wing. And it like, wasn't it Greg, it was just this random guy. But what are you staying, what are you staying in? It's like, oh, yeah, you staying in, he's all right, hi. Clean that guy again this year, eh? Aye, Gary's brilliant, man. Watch this. Aye, <laughs> I mean, people would just love to see that, you know. That's me just off the stage, is Gary, yeah? The oh, thought of you smoking a cigarette is funny enough to me. I mean, I, I would that. be like, what are you doing? I could never carry off the cigarette, Luke, but um, there you go. But yeah, that was that was a roundabout way. Of, <laughs> and then when I came out of uni, uh, with the degree, which I was just, I, I hadn't, I didn't even consider ever doing anything with, really with that degree I was I stayed yeah. at home for a year worked in a in a, a, a sports centre the Commonwealth Pool in Edinburgh and then saved up and went to drama school I was going to say I've got a memory I love when you know someone really well and all these moments come back and you go mm. I've got a memory of you being some sort of lifeguard or pool attendant <laughs> I'm sure oh, you God, were would... did you not were you not a pool attendant at one point that always makes me giggle no you I wish they would. I'm a terrible swimmer, but what I did, I um, mean, well, I, I can swim, but I'm not. I, I wouldn't trust me to save anyone's life. I'd probably kill them, but I'd probably just drag them down underneath. Help, help me. Help, help. Me. Help, help. Help, me. help me. Or you just get knackered. You get them and you're halfway across the pool and you start sinking. I would. I'd be like, oh, I'm sorry, mate. It's me or you. Uh, and, um, but, but, it, doing that job, I was a, a sole gym membership, right? That's what I did. And um, they employed me 9 till 5 or 10 till 6 or whatever, whatever the hours were, right? And what was important about me mentioning that is that nobody buys a gym membership in mid-morning or mid-afternoon, right? No one uh -huh. does. You, you okay. might pop in before work after you've done yeah. a session in the gym or you might pop in at lunchtime or you might yeah. pop in after work. But you see, I had about six hours during the day where there was no one, just no one coming to see me. And it was a council run pool. So, and, and as long as I didn't upset the status quo of the pool, I was left to do whatever I want. As long as I didn't get stick my nose in other people's business. And there was a lot going on at that pool. It was amazing. <laughs> a lot, a lot going of characters on. in there, McHugh. Well, I wrote a script about it, actually. I wrote a script. Um, yeah, so basically what I did was write stand-up during the day. So that's how I started doing stand-ups. I wrote stand up during the day and then I performed after I'd done these sessions at the at the pool. So yeah. that that fed into that. So all of a sudden I was doing stand up yeah. four nights a week. Yeah, it's really interesting. I love hearing that path of like when I say I used to work in nightclubs and things and in downtime I always snuck the laptop out and was doing things. It's like you were always kind of even if you didn't quite know what you wanted mm. to do, you you were doing something. You were Yeah, yeah, to go. always so, so what? How? So then you obviously went to train at the, the RSAMD, which is mm -hmm. a, a, an amazing place to go and train, and that's what I want to chat to you about before we talk about my favourite boy in the world. Um, seriously, I love him so much more than I love you. You know that, and I'm, I've got no, no apology for it. I don't look like Alex today at all, really. Oh, you will in a minute. I'll make you look <laughs> like him. <laughs> I'll bring Julia and he'll appear. Um, yeah, but I just think it's really interesting because we've been chatting, I've been chatting to some other people about kind of stigma and how you get boxed in. And so I was chatting to, for example, Karen Cargill, who's a beautiful friend of ours. Yeah, yeah. Who's sending so much love to you, by the way. Oh, I love Karen, yeah. She, we, we were chatting about how she's a part of a really prestigious society, you know, prestigious, and how uh, she tours the world and, and uh, sings classically. She sings opera yeah. and kind of the stigma around opera and how people think, because I was explaining to her when I was younger, I, I lived in Govan Hill and I went to Langside College, I was 17, I was the opposite of you, I went to college to do my diploma in acting when I was 17 and um, and like you said, I kind of, I did that and then I was I was surrounded by people all the time, but it's just, I, that's where I was and I, and I loved, I sang classically, which again, the stigma you know, around me would sometimes people would be like, oh, I can't imagine you singing classically. And mm -hmm. she and we were just saying how you can almost be boxed into something where you've been boxed into cop not not now but but a while ago, especially particularly in Scotland. It was like oh Greg McHugh, he does comedy, he's a stand up, he does Gary mm -hmm. Tank. And like never really been seen for drama. Not that there's a lot of drama going on up here, but I think you you felt that you were quite often in this comedy box, even though 
you'd done this really great training, you know, and this theatre-based training, this real craft. How, yeah, how I do think... You, it's changed now, but how? what did you think about that at the time? Was, was that kind of frustrating for you? Well, uh, what, what was frustrating when I came out of drama school, age 24, was that... Um, a, uh, do you know what? I won't go into specifics, but there's one theatre where I'd really pestered the um, artistic director. I used to go and see all everything at this particular theatre, everything, and I'd go all the Q&As, and I'd sent my stuff in. I didn't have an agent, and no one would look at me as an actor. I couldn't get an agent. And it's I said unbelievable to, to know that. It's unbelievable well, to know it's, that. Well, you know, it, it, that, took, that took a move to London to get an agent and get... It just get shows you, doesn't it? It just shows you how things yeah. work. Well, how wrong what, what people really, can be. What I'll never forget, because it meant a lot to me at the time, was the artistic director I spoke to after a specific Q&A session. In fact, it was Brian Cox was doing um, Uncle... Oh, wow. Uncle Varick, I think, uh, years ago. Uh -huh. um, and <laughs> I, I, I got the artistic and I said, look, I, I know you've got a production coming up and I know the production and I know a character and would you please, and I had my photo and I had my rubbishy CV of drama school production, I said, would you please just have a look at me? I'm not asking for anything other than I'll, I'll compare to, a chance. And he said, you know what, I will. And he never did. He never got in touch with this dude. And then I got asked a few years ago to do something with this individual and I, I turned it down because I just thought, but that frustrated me was, this is, and I, and I think that was one of the moments I went, I'm out here. If I can speak to someone and, and see them face to face and they won't even get back to me, I said, I'm out here. I, mean, I went to London and, and things kind of really took off from there. But, but there's a, there was a different thing. That was pre-Tank Commander. So there's mm -hmm. a different thing that comes in once you get known for something. And... Scotland is a small industry. It should be bigger. It should really be much bigger. Yeah. Um, but we all know the reasons for that and studios and funding and, and blah, 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 blah. Um, but once you have a TV show and the TV show becomes this thing, which was fairly successful, successful um, not, not, not still game, but still got a good following and popular. It's like Gary is such a kind of big, broad guy who I'm very proud of, but people were like, well, if he does that, there's no way he can do anything else. And it's an assumption and it is an, it's a stigma, but also there's a snobbery yeah. and there's still a snobbery yeah. towards comedy. And me and you know how technical comedy is and how, yeah. how much you need to build a character and how much you need to work very hard at 10 to seven in order to, 10 to seven at night as you're gonna rap at seven o'clock to land a punchline, to make it yes. funny, to, to be on that, to concentrate that. Um, so in my early days with Tank, as I tried to break free of that, uh, I did get frustrated, but it, it becomes a waste of your energy. And so I just channeled it by going to London and, and meeting producers and meeting other directors who eventually said, look, I can see that you can do other things. But if I was being yeah. very honest, yes, it did drive me. It did make me go to London, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? How I don't know if you feel the same way, but I often find when I feel... Um, uh, you, you encounter quite a lot of what you said, the key word is assumption, people assume. I find people mm. assume a lot about me as well. And what I find happens is this fire in your stomach, it, you, I, I almost work best from that. I, it's almost like, oh, okay, right, cool, well, I'll just go do it. I'm just going to do it myself. And it's like, yeah. you're not going to be able to do everything yourself. Of course you're not, because there's a huge industry, a lot of money, but... I wonder if a lot of that, like the, the kind of balls to go, I'm going to go and we'll speak to that producer. Would you have done that if you hadn't felt that feeling of someone presuming you couldn't? I wonder if it's a, a little no, bit I of think, a, a catalyst, I think you're right. you know? I think, I think if I'd come out of drama school, got an agent in Scotland, started doing theatre work in Scotland, um, built up a career in Scotland, I don't, think, I don't think I would have. And I'm not saying, by the way, that, going to London is better than staying in Scotland and working in Scotland. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that's what I had to do. Yeah. <laughs> I had to do that to work. It's and an then, amazing thing. People wouldn't yeah. know that, Greg. People will be so surprised to hear you saying that you're not, you're actually not talking about like You're not going, I tried to go down to London and I was too big for my boots. You're actually saying that in your home country, nobody would take you on no. nobody would give you a chance and no, that one, is... no, no agent would take me on and no no one would see me for independent 
auditions really I got a couple and then Baldy Bean Theatre Company was a pivotal they they had a look at me in a group audition and, and gave me work um, and that's where I met Brian Ferguson you know Brian oh uh, yeah brilliant, brilliant actor and he's a, he's uh, a good buddy of mine talented, yeah. hugely talented so the, I mean I'm not so yeah so I've kind of contradicted myself to an extent but there was not many people who would um, yeah. have a look at me and so yes it was it was not a matter of that it wasn't a matter of oh I'm too good for here it was a matter of oh my god no, no I have to go and try and uh -huh. make a go of it so then in a, when do, I went yeah. to London as well a lot of people wouldn't realize this but um Tank Commander was taken on by Channel 4 originally so me and Will Andrews who you know who we did the E4 yeah. funny cut with e, it was an E4 funny cut commissioned by Channel 4 and then eventually when we won a BAFTA, a Mick BAFTA, Scottish BAFTA, um, <laughs> for Gary's War, uh, that was when BBC Scotland came in. So it was actually from being down south that this Scottish character was given a chance, believe it or not. It's yeah. so mad. It's so mad. Isn't and it then, crazy? Hmm. And all the, all the, I love to think of all the, and I love, I know all the representatives up here, they're probably the same people, and they're, they're beautiful individuals. But I guarantee you, knowing them, they will be crying into their bank accounts now, going, oh my God, this man, because what you've done, you're one of the most versatile um, performers, that's not the right word, like, it's a, bit, it's a little bit wanky, but you are I'll, one of the most I'll versatile. I'll take performer. You're, but you're one of the most versatile artists, because you're so, you're creative, you do so many different things creatively, and, but performance-wise as well, you're like, you have got so much range and people haven't actually been able to see that a lot. You know, they've, it's, it's only in the last few years that people I knew, because me and you, you and I met, me and you, you and me, you and I, <laughs> you and I met doing a sketch comedy, mm -hmm. which again, huge stigma on sketch comedy. Like oh. sketch comedy is where you see everyone's ability, their yeah, acting, yeah. their craft, yeah. their, how they can take on a character, the physicality of it all, the voice, Everything and how they can change their delivery, everything yeah. they know about acting. Everything. Sketch so is the best. The best. Yeah. The best. And it's such a, it taught me, that's where I learned my comedy, without doubt. It's in your bones, like you say, you were in school writing the way you still write, which I love. Actors love the way you write because it's all there for you. Everything's punctuated and you can hear it. Even if your teacher thought it was no good, we love it. We think it's genius, <laughs> you know? But so you were doing that, and I was obviously telling stories and mimicking people like Karen Dunbar and people that at the time that I was watching think they were incredible. So mm -hmm. we're kind of, we've obviously got our own, our own little, it's in our, it's in the comedies in your blood, I think for sure, right? Yeah, I think but, it is, yeah. But you do learn from a sketch comedy for me and you're who I learned with, you and Will and people like yes. Lovely Marge and uh, taking on all these different characters, you know, it was just, it was such a well, great time. You know, awful sketch comedy is awful, right? But brilliant sketch comedy is astounding, and I'm not saying that yeah. we were we were astounding, but we let we learned, and that is that is part of the process. It's not, it, it, you know, I'm not even too self congratulatory here, but the first sketches I wrote were rubbish, absolutely rubbish. But it's a learning game. It's like acting is a craft, and you learn your craft, and you keep practicing writing, and and it starts with sketch, or it goes on to short, you know, the E4 funny cut, and then sitcom yeah. and. And hopefully yeah. onwards, but um, yeah, you're right. Sketch is, is, and you know, you do hear this about sketch. Oh yeah, you know, we want to bring sketch back. Well, why don't they? How are you going to develop new artists? How are you going to develop new actors? How are you going to give people breaks in small sketches, which is how it used to work? You know, all the the great sketch uh -huh. shows of the Fast Show and then um, you know, you name it, uh, not the nine o'clock news and all these kind of shows. Like unless yeah. you can give actors smaller parts, it's very difficult to keep developing them. Yeah, and you get to see the craft of everyone, and also these characters are born. You you always find in a good sketch show, there's maybe, I mean, look at Still Game, Jack and oh, Victor. Genius. These characters come from these beautifully written sketch material, yeah. and then they then they have their own world, and that's like uh, Gary Tank. Um, I, I was totally. saying that actually, I saw your range very from very young. I mean, I was really young. I was, I must have been 19, 20 when I first was, when we first started working together. 17. You're, only, you're um, only a wee couple of years older than me, but I, I saw yeah. this range, but everybody else didn't know about it. Most, mostly, you know, people that come to see us, but now, now, everybody gets to enjoy this and see this range that you've got and these 
amazing parts. I mean, we've got to we've got to talk. I mean, you've got the, you do this brilliant part in Discovery of Witches. What's his name? Is it Hamish? The Hamish. Small, wonderful. small, small, but interesting little part. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but my. And you've done so many other things. Um, um, Howard and is Howard, isn't it? Fresh meat. Yeah, yeah, Howard and Fresh meat. Yeah. I know it's very uh, really but, impressive. But yeah. I just I don't want to rush through it, but I'm aware of time, and I just we've got to talk. We need to because honestly, I can't tell you. I, I've told you this so many times. I always thought with um, you and all your work you do that Gary Tank would always. No, no one's ever going to beat him for me, right? In my admiration, but. The A word, I can't tell you. Like it is oh. one of the most beautiful. I can't rave about it enough. Like the show, the show itself is just so well written. The characters are just so identifiable. They're so perfectly. There's they're so perfectly balanced. You know everybody yeah. in that show, and then you play this. It's lovely to see you even just speaking in another voice. You know, in the Northern English accent, the mm-hmm. Manchurian. And just watching you, knowing what I know, what you can do, and seeing you getting to show everybody else what you can do, for me, I felt really, really proud watching it. Oh, thank you. I felt the A words. It's one of these really interesting, really interesting jobs for lots of different reasons. But going back a little bit, just before A word, um, where I met uh, Pete Bowker, the writer of A word, is a. Uh, I'll tell you a wee story about an audition I had. For yes. a film, uh, well, this is this is one of the, one of these kind of golden story, well, golden moments in my career. Um, What's the and, film called again? Because you told me, and I need to yeah, remember it this time. It's so called Marvelous, it. Marvelous, Marvelous, and it's a BBC film. And when I got that script through, and I was auditioning, it wasn't an offer. But, um, I got the script through, and I was reading it in the kitchen, and I started crying. Right, and you know me. Really. Ah, uh-huh. yeah. I'm not. A, I'm not a big crier. I, you know, I'm an emotional, the idiot actor. But um, I was reading it, and my wife turned in and was like, "What? What is? What, what are you reading?" <laughs> and, I, and I was like, "I was like, oh my god!" I said, "You just won't. You won't believe this script." So I read. I must have read the script about five or six times. I, I became, really? Like, yeah, but the part I was reading up, the part I was up for, it just wasn't suitable, and I knew it. But it was one of oh, these no. ones where you go. Oh, look, the script is so good. I'd just love to be any part in this. But I, I don't, anyway, yeah. so I went into the audition, um, and the director is this, um, one of the best uh, guys I've ever worked with, um, uh, Julian Farino. He's called a fantastic director. And I read, you know, I knew it inside out because I'd learned. I was off, you know, I was ready to listen to direction. Anyway, he did it a few times, and um, I just knew in the room, and and he was he was willing me. Julian was willing me, and and then anyway. He said, great. And I knew, and he knew, and, and I left the room. Oh. And I thought, oh, man, that's a shame, because that script is something special. It's going to do something special. I know it. I know it is. And it yeah. did. It, very, it did incredibly well. Anyway, I, I leave the room, go down the stairs, and my agent phones me and says, where are you? I'm like, well, you know where I am. I'm just out of audition. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know where I am. Ah. Uh-huh. You know, probably a bit peed off at the whole situation. Anyway, I'm, and she said, no, no, no. She said, can, can, would you go back in the room? And I was like, uh, well, yeah. So I went back upstairs and Julian, the director, came out and said, look, I wouldn't normally do this, but because it's not fair on you. He was saying, it's not fair on you, but there's another part in this that I oh think you would be really suitable for, Malcolm. But I know you've not had time to prepare and I don't want to put you in a position where you're not comfortable cold reading, you know, co- the cold readers, you know, when you don't know it in front of And I said, I've read this script so many times. I know that scene inside oh. out. And he oh said, but could you, do, can you do a Northern accent? I said, well, I can, I can give you, and because of sketch, you know, I can give you a, a, a broad Northern, Ireland, yeah. uh, Northern English accent and then we could, we could fine tune it as we get towards the production. Anyway, I read that part and I knew and he knew and I, I got offered it um, pretty much after that. And so I got a bigger, better part. That's and then, amazing. Um, it's just, it was just a dream. And then Peter, the writer, I got to know, um, and then the film itself, marvelous. Like Toby Jones is in it, who's incredible, and Gemma Jones won the BAFTA for her performance. Oh, I in can't it. wait! I, I need to watch it. I really oh, want we to are, see we that. Are, I promise you. Yeah. I promise you, and I'm a small bit in it, but I love what I do because I get to work with Toby, and he's amazing. Um, but you, 
I on I know you like it. I know you love it. It's a really special film. Um, anyway, oh, so that, oh. that so my round away again. Talking too much, but um, Peter never Bo- listen. It's geisha chat. You're never talking uh, too much to me. Well, Everyone wants to hear what you've got to say. But if you're talking about how these things really work, and me and you know this, yeah. and, and, and people hear it out there, but the writing is what the writing is everything in America. The writer is king in this country. It's I think it's getting better, but yeah. Yeah. Writer is king. And so Peter Bowker in the A word has his, he, like in Marvelous, he's got this beautiful, and I don't even know how he does it, ability of bittersweet without it becoming saccharine, without it becoming schmaltzy, unbelievable. It's this yeah. very, very fine line of how he does it. So the A word to get to do that after doing Marvelous with him as well is, um, oh, joy. So, so would that, that then obviously had come from that? being part of that that moment where you could have actually talked yourself out of that room really you could have went look I'm not going to come and I love this but I'm not going to come and read for you because it's just I know I'm not going to get it and if you hadn't have gone no do you know what I want to be in that room with him yeah then possibly the a word might there's potential that might you might not have they might not have really thought of you for that I I, I suspect so to be honest Isn't yeah because well, it is interesting because you, the the path of this madness industry and, and career is you, you you don't know, but the more you the more you take a chance, the more you put yourself out there, the more you just say, and and it's exposing. We both know how exposing that is of to do that is to go, yeah, I'll put myself out there again, and you know, this these are the good stories. You know, the hundreds of auditions I've had where I've yeah. not got anything. You, you feel yeah. terrible, and. Um, that's the flip side of the coin, but you've got to remember you keep keep putting yourself out there, and I still have to do that yeah. now. You know, I one I just wanted to ask you as well, but I mean the A words people can watch it when this interview is on. I think the A word will probably be just finishing, mm-hmm. and it is a jo- an absolute joy, particularly your episode. I think it's episode three and C. Yeah. No, C- three. series three, series three, three, yeah, three, yeah, three and three, three yeah. yeah. Three, three, um, three, three, kick. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of your, you, you know, you're in it throughout. Beautiful art. I mean, it's just there you go. I mean, you go this kind of central family, and then you're you're supposed to be extended family. But you're you know your whole dynamic, and I, I mean, we could talk about it all day. Everybody should just go and watch it because it is the most beautiful. Th- it genuinely, and I know you've done it for a while. And when you work, as you know, and continuing drama particularly you don't get to watch mm. a lot of television so no. I had I was really late to get to see it I'd seen snippets of you that I love but getting to watch it properly you're so brilliant in it and I'm oh, I'm so I'm so proud of you honestly I just think it's wonderful and I hope they I think they're maybe talking about a, another series do you know can you give us a wee sneaker on that do you know anything about it I, I mean obviously I don't, not and currently be, but no I, I really don't I genuinely don't and also Eddie's kind of um it would be questionable whether whether within his arc he would be required for another one. Yeah. But you never know. You never know. Um, and yeah. to work with Peter again and the team, I mean, it's, it's an amazing team of people that make that show. Um, so uh, you, you know what it's like. You know, yeah. we don't, we're not told. I know. Listen, I can't, um, I can't let you leave my living room <laughs> without chatting to you about our favourite boy, my favourite boy, one of Scotland's very most, very actual favouritest boys in the actual very world. Oh, God. He is Gary Tank Commander. Um, to give a quick bit of background, obviously he started off, uh, Julie came from me watching you, was chatting about the fact he, he started off um, as a kind of stand-up character that you did uh, in a very intimate uh, setting. And that's where I love him most, actually. We'll just chat quickly about the, the, you know, the growth, how he did end up on the huge stage. But I loved him most, and I've always loved him most live. So even though we're shooting television, I've got that live aspect of being next to him and watch it because I just think there's something about him live that you does not put it this way, right? I feel really privileged because in a Julie kind of way to say this, there's not a lot of people that actually get to meet Gary in the flesh. <laughs> Do you know what you I mean? Do, I get to stand you with You do him. love Gary. I absolutely, he's genius. When people watch this and see people that maybe don't know you off screen, 
watch you being interviewed, and that, that shows my friend Greg, when they see the difference between you and this character you've created, it, it's mind-blowing. It still blows my mind the minute you turn into him. He's just it's, a total it's kind joy. Of, it's, it's, it's too easy. It's a bit odd, actually, how, how quickly <laughs> I can black into him. Uh, but I know, it's wrong, and it? it's just wrong. But uh, yeah, yeah, going back to the live days of Gary, it's interesting <laughs> because when people, when you're not on TV and you do an act like that, it's very like, it didn't, it, it got stronger and stronger and stronger, but it took people a while to be like, what, what is this? What is this guy? Yeah. On? What is he doing? And then once they got it. Yeah, you know, he's so I'm, different because there's nobody like him. So different to... At that point, there was no one doing stand-up like the stuff I was doing as Gary. And I think audiences, when they started to get that, it was, I was talking about Iraq and Afghanistan and about George Bush and about, um, you know, Osama and Tony Blair and Hans Blix and these things. It was my attempt to kind of, to draw a bit of attention to what was going on in, in a ridiculous who was the way. R? Hmm? Who was the R? I think it was Gordon Brown. The oh. R, the pirate. <laughs> No, a pal of mine says he's got a wooden leg. <laughs> a pal of mine did says he get, he's got Did he ask him, Tony? That's Tony. one of my favourites. Did he ask him, Danny? That's true. I thought, true that you battled. Um, oh, who was that guy? He battered that someone's dad with a Did hockey stick. Was... With an ice hockey. It was an ice hockey stick, I think. I don't know what. Tony, I don't know what that's what Tony, Tony, I'll say it better. Tony! <laughs> People will see where Julie was born. That's what happened. You were standing doing stand up, and I went home. I saw you. I knew you before. I saw Gary, and I went home and did the full cheesy pasta monologue to my dad. Get full, oh, full thing with all the timing. I just walked it honestly. Like, <laughs> can with this, can with this, Matt, get away from me. Get away. I did the whole thing right, and my dad was like, "Have you, how many times have you seen this?" Just like once. I was like obsessed. <laughs> and then there was some beautiful moment. We obviously did three series of that. And then um, mm. to do three series of an sh- ensemble um, piece, oh, an brilliant. ensemble comedy in Scotland, is, it's hard because, like you said, we don't have a lot of opportunity for these things. There's, it's not anyone's fault, really. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a business thing. Actually, going back to where you first learned about, you know, business, mm-hmm. that's, it is about money and about business and things. But... So to, to, to have that success and to have created it and to have gone on that journey and been brave, you've got to be brave. There's a lot of things you've got to do and where you, where you, well, you, do, you cross cause over that fear. I can, I can talk about it now, but, you know, I turned down the fourth. You know, I, I, I said to them, we were in talks about a fourth and I'd started doing yeah. fresh meat at that point and, uh, and, you know, going back to I was becoming Gary Tank Commander and, you know, it's one thing walking down the street and everyone shouting Gary, that's... That's that's part and parcel, and it shows that you're you know you're you've made an impact. But in terms of if you can't get any other work, you're going, yeah. Wow, what am I going to do here? Eight yeah. series of Gary, and then I'll never work. I will never yeah. work again um, in also, another role. You have a very strong work work ethic as well, where your attention to detail is so specific. You're also um, one of the only people I know that's ever a, not allowed, but that, that you would you would welcome in to write is our friend Chris Grady, who's an exceptional writer and that you've known for oh, a long brilliant. time. But you wouldn't, you wouldn't, and rightly so, and everyone would understand why, but because sometimes I would say to you, why don't you just, you know, the characters develop, why don't you just let something write it? And you're like, absolutely no chance. Like, there's no way mm-hmm. it could be. And you're right, because I know now, I, I didn't realise as much about writing then, but there's no way someone could really take the whole thing and create it without you being heavily heavily overseeing it you know no i mean chris and I wrote, well. yeah chris and i co-wrote i think three eps of series three because i was too by that point i was just too busy i couldn't and i love chris yeah. chris is a brilliant writer in his own right he, he's, and script editor he's, yeah. he's a very he's a very special dude he is he's brilliant and also great to work with which is yeah we should of, mention he, he edits my live um one woman shows and he's incredible and um, on can, I, can I tell you something really quickly that that you might not realise? This is beautiful, right? Chris Grady, Ellie, I don't get a lot of huge drama in River City because Ellie's quite light. Even though she, she has drama, she doesn't play really high drama, right? She's quite a, a light a character, really warm and full of heart. And they gave her this story, a very unusual dark storyline of a miscarriage. It was awful. It was beautiful for me to get to play. 
and it was my first piece of my own story, like my own A, a story happening to Ellie and no one else. And Chris Grady wrote it. And he, Who we he started wrote, with doing sketch. He, he, he's the guy that we loved. We used to pick his name out going, who's that guy? He's brilliant. He wrote it. He was known for comedy. He, he, he's known to me for comedy. He writes and edits Gary Tank Commander. And he also edits my show. He was editing my show before that. And he wrote that most beautiful episode. It's one of the most beautiful episodes I've ever performed. And you watch it, yeah, yeah. By him. Isn't that wonderful? It's he's great. very, very clever. So he, yeah, he's head, He's who you kind of trust with with the character, isn't he? Like, if you had to trust someone to help. Uh, yeah, Chris understands how the, the, the psychology of these idiots kind of um, get through their get through their, their, their problem of the week or whatever Gary has created, but he also structurally is great in terms of problem solving. You'll know, like, once you start a sitcom, it has to ramp up and then yeah. partially resolve whilst making it worse and, and it all has to kind of tie in. I mean, it's not... Well, it is complicated. It is complicated. Even a simple episode is complicated because you've got to fill 28 minutes of a storyline with multiple characters. But yeah. when you're, when my brain is on the jokes and on the, the hopefully the, the the Gary nonsense and the Julie nonsense and the Jacko and and you know Charlie and and uh, Sergeant uh, Thompson, who I spoke to the other night on Zoom, uh, spoke to Stu Stu Bowman. Um, Beautiful. Oh, oh, yeah. Um, McClintock, why am I standing here shouting when I should be over there? Drinking! It's my favourite line. <laughs> Why are you riding a cow? Oh, he, he made me corpse but, like 10 times of that. Of mm, course, we, like... um, then you got the opportunity to do the hydro and we got to transfer mm. from... It went full circle for me from watching this character on stage. And I will... I've told you this before. Never mm. forget the moment where... We stood at the end because you did your final monologue, and we stood me and Bowman, who you're talking about, yeah. Dayton, the pair is bawling, <laughs> watching you standing at the side of the podium that you were on in front of ten thousand people doing the cheesy pasta monologue. And yeah. I swear I couldn't contain. There's always moments of joy and emotion on stage, but that was a real moment I'll never forget because I just felt as if everything had gone, had gone like that from that girl running home telling my dad. I was so proud of what you'd done, and I know it was a hard, hard, hard oh, task. It was for hard. You. It was hard. It was massive. It was too big. It was too big for me to do, and on top of having a first child and moving house, yeah. and and then that led to some really difficult times after that. But but yeah, no, that, that but but taking that moment in particular of you know, the, the, I'm not I'm not playing it down right, but from those moments all the way to the hydro, you you can't do these things in isolation and you need to have brilliant people around you, which I've had. And I've also had incredible cast members in yourself and the team behind tank and a brilliant script editor and all of these yeah. things feed in. And I'm really proud of, of what we did and, and what it's not about, and it's not an achievement. It's an achievement in one sense, but it's all about just creating the work and keeping stuff good quality. And that's what I'm proud of is that the quality to me never dropped like the hydro yeah. creatively is the best script I've ever written. It was brilliant. And it was the best thing. It was about something. As much as it was nonsense, it was actually about something. And so when you guys all came to the rehearsal room, and I, I was in a, I was starting to, my mind was starting to go a wee bit, but you guys kept me very sane and added in and just kept bringing brilliant things, was that in the end, that show, what we did was we used all of our creativity from working together for years and made that the best thing. And that's what I'll always yeah. remember is... is it's almost the Everyone, rehearsal room for me was as big as doing the shows. That was it amazing. It was wonderful because we didn't get to play. We weren't in television. We didn't ever get to play no, with the characters. No. Seeing us, seeing the development that each person does at home on their own, on a character in the room together, and having someone else's opinion on it was like oh, joyous. It was amazing. And it was that's amazing. what I love about you and I getting to rehearse for pantomime and becoming getting to be a double oh, act yeah. in a different sense. Because I got to. I got I was playing your mum, so I got to bring my my own comedy style into me and you being on stage with Gary, which was so interesting for me, and it was a mm -hmm. real joy because we know each other so well. I can't leave without asking you what everybody Scotland will never forgive me if I do not ask you the question that is most asked to me when I'm stopped by Gary Tank fans and asked to you often, and they'll hear the answer here from the horse's mouth. Will we ever see? 
Gary and the gang again in any capacity, be it television or stage. Are they are they done? Are, will we will we get? Because you're the boss. I say to everyone, you need to ask the gaffer. So, uh, but, uh, but see, this one, is the, but you but you you with respect, you do know that's not the case. Is that I'm I'm not really the boss because would I, I think the question is would I like to do another one? Yes, I would like to do another one. Is there an opportunity to do another one? TV wise, I think BBC Scotland don't seem that keen to do another group yes. one. It's a shame, isn't it? Because that always confuses me. And I work, I work a lot. I work up here all the time, and I love BBC Scotland. There, there, where I work, and I always find that very interesting. You know that I go, oh God, are they not? Are they? And I just maybe it's a thing that they think that it's it's it's. Kind of, I, I can't explain it because um, I think it's still very current. I think it's still think, a very current thing. Well, I think you can make it current. I think you can use Gary in these yeah. interviews and, and, and the stories of the week or the bigger stories in the world to, to be reflecting Gary. I think you can do that. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't the most satirical show on BBC. Um, that's because it kind of changed and, and it, it was probably right to do so from Channel 4, obviously. But, um, I, you know, I'm not having a pop at BBC Scotland. I think there is an argument as well that, you know, we, we got three CDs of Gary and it's really good and... and we're all now working in different shows and our careers yep. have really, you know, moved on a lot. And there is, there, is a, there is a need for new talent to come through and there's a need maybe for the Liam McRae sitcom to come through, you know, for what you're writing, for what you're doing. And, and no, I don't say that as a, I think, I think you know, get, does, should, should Gary come back? I think what would be lovely is if we got a show a year, a Christmas special or, or you that know, some kind wonderful. of show. But I also think there's a massive need in, in Scotland for new talent to come through and for some of the development we got as young performers needs to happen again. And then the next big ca comedy character needs to come through and there's, there's loads of talent and you should be given an opportunity to write your sitcom. And then Gary should be maybe given, you know, one a year for we can all meet up and do a... Do that's a thing. so lovely to hear you saying that. You've actually been mentioned in other interviews uh, I have to point out, actually, by a all-female interview, me and the girls, Gail and Louise, who you know well, who are the dolls, yeah. and your name came up as somebody who's a champion of women, who's a man who stars and writes comedy, but is is a very, very, very giving and, uh, you know, and, and, and really embracing of, of, of women uh, in comedy, because it is difficult, you know, it's a whole other... yeah conversation but I just wanted you to know that you are you're somebody that we often talk about as it's so lovely to hear it's lovely to be supported by people that you respect and that whose work that you love for them to encourage you and say that you're good enough to do something it's really lovely well, to hear. I, I genuinely believe it and I do want to say to young female you know sometimes it does sound just disingenuous like a white guy in, turning 40 who's who's you know had a good career and things are going all right for him but we do need especially in Scotland, and I mean, when has there ever been a female-led sitcom in Scotland? Has there ever been one? Well, this is what I was going to tell you, Louise. Uh, Julie wilson Nimmo, who you know mm -hmm. well, who's, who was um, Miss Hooley, and she does mm -hmm. loads of lovely comedy. She's also married to Greg Hempel, who's a hugely yeah. successful male uh, writer who's in Still Game and, and writes it. And um, her and Louise did a tiny spin-off. I think it was actually only an internet broadcast. Um, but that was the first, the first all-female piece of comedy in Scotland. And do you know what she said? Louise went, I mean, I mean, I know it's not a big deal because there's only two of us. And I went, that's even worse. There's only yeah. two of you and it's still the only one, you know? But, but the culture, that. the culture has to change. And that's about... There's so... I mean, this goes, this goes all the way into schooling, into how women yeah. are socialized into their portrayal in the media into what is allowed to be funny for women and not for men and hopefully with shows like Fleabag and you know Julia Davis's work and Catastrophe and Sharon Horgan and my buddy yeah. Holly Walsh and there's there's so many yeah. brilliantly talented females but in Scotland especially it, I just don't understand you know you look at Derry Girls and you're like where the is the Scottish you know, version of that? Do you know what it is, Greg? It's um, I'm very aware of time, but the 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 what I think it is is it's the very it's the very Scottish, and particularly female mentality of not blowing your own horn, not not tooting your own horn, blowing your own I trumpet. I don't, I don't, I don't think but it is that. Women I do feel like that male, a lot, though. It's male-driven 
people in positions of power, and I hate to say that, if there was females in positions of major power championing talent, it would yes. change. But I, so I, don't, I wouldn't say it's about the female attitude. You don't have that attitude. You're a creative. Louise not, and not now, Gail. Not now, but I think to get to the elevated position that you're talking about, you have to have you have to have a belief and you have to have no apology for your talent. And I do think that quite often because the way society is, men sometimes can, can, can kind of do that a little bit more easily. And I think that comes down of to course. Talk about society and all that stuff. Listen, let's do something really fun because you need to go. I've kept you long oh, enough. I do need to Hi. go. I've got, yeah. we, we've got 30 seconds, right? And we're going to do a little Mr. and Mrs. because we've worked together since we we're very young. And I right. thought this would be really good fun. So we've got pens. What colours have you got? Let me see your pens. Hold them up. Yeah, yellow, pink. Right. So I'm going to be pink, Ob. Yeah. And you're going to be yellow. And I'm going okay. to ask some Mr. It's going to be hard because I'm the quiz master as well. So, right, ready? Right. We'll do it really quickly. So um, give me a wee second after I ask the question, right? Because I need to get my pen. <laughs> right, ready? Right, really. Here we go. Right. Leah McCray. Liam McCray and Greg McHugh, Mr and Mrs, Julian Gary, starts now. Who is the loudest? Uh, what, are you pink? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the cheekiest? Uh, uh. Who is the cleverest? Ah, you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> you, you'll not be doing that soon, trust me. Yeah. Who is the best dancer? Oh. Who's the best singer? Yeah. Who is the best at timekeeping? Who gets drunk more quickly? Oh, I think I... <laughs> Who is the calmest in a crisis? <laughs> this is a good one. Who is the naughtiest, the most mischievous of us two? Go on probably in. me. That's probably what I think. Me. Yeah. Here's a good one. Who's more likely to start a fight? An argument? Oh, it's probably me. Sorry. But who's more likely to finish a fight? <laughs> Um, I'll, go, I'll go towards the end. Um, who buys the best presents? Oh, yeah, you do. Yeah. Who gives the best advice? Oh, oh, I don't know. We're both pretty good at that. Yeah, I think we're quite good at that. Um, who swears the most? <laughs> and who will be your bestest pal for life? <laughs> Greg McHugh, I can't oh. thank you enough. You're genuinely, with complete sincerity, one of my favourite humans for so many reasons. You're, you're oh, you. the most talented boy that I know, oh, and I tell up. everyone that. No, and I know a lot of talented people, by the way. <laughs> you are no. genius, and we love you so much up here, and we hope, we hope to see you up here again, because we miss you. We know why well, you're doing back. all your big stuff, but we want you, we want you back as well. When you like Arnie says, I'm gonna be back in that room. <laughs> Seriously? Oh my god, the actual god. Thank you so, so much, thank you. Bye bye. Cheers.